Good evening, viewers, and very welcome to the first live webcast of 2023. Now, it's been quite a few weeks already, but I hope that you enjoyed a nice uh, Christmas vacation and uh, transition into the new year. Haven't seen you since the Christmas special. Today, I am going to be focusing a little bit on Capture 2023. I am also going to uh, recap some useful information that I think is, is worth recapping. And not to mention that we've added several new customers during the, uh, the past year. So for some of you, it will be new information as well. Now I'm going to um, talk a bit about Capture 2023. I'll be recapping some useful information and towards the end, I'll try to answer some of your questions. Um, keep in mind that you can start asking the questions already now in the chat. Um, it's good if you do it now rather than later because it takes a little bit of time for them to reach me. The only type of question I will not be answering today is whether we are adding a specific feature to Capture 2023. If you want to know which features come in 2023, you're going to have to wait until the release. So with that said, start sending questions and I'm going to get straight to it. Capture 2023. Starting with some dates. This is of course the top thing everyone is curious about. And I have three important dates for you. If you are a translator or one of our resellers or distributors, then you are part of a group that we call pre-release access. You will get access to Capture 2023 on Monday next week. After this, there is a four week period for our translators to translate all the new features and changes for Capture 2023. Uh, as well as for some testing, of course, that tends to happen during this period uh, so that we have a chance to fix weird stuff that we discover. And then following tradition, we have a release webcast where I go through all the new features in the new version. And this happens the 13th of March. February is, is the only month with normally 28 days, so four weeks is the same date but a month later for those who enjoy some calendar facts. And on the day after the release webcast we have the general release which is Tuesday the 14th of March. So that will be the day where everyone will be able to download the new version, purchase upgrades and take 2023 for a spin. Then we have something that we call our grace period, which starts today. This grace period is a period of time during which purchases makes you eligible to a free upgrade to Capture 2023. As long as you are purchasing a brand new license or a version upgrade. So if you don't own Capture today and you purchase Capture 2022 today or the next five weeks, then you will have, well, you will receive a free upgrade to 2023 once it's been released. If you own Capture 2021 or something older and you upgrade that to 2022, which is our current version, anytime during the next five weeks, then you will also be eligible for a free upgrade to 2023. The only exception is if you own, say, a solo edition and you decide to upgrade that to a duet edition, this does not entitle you to a free upgrade to 2023. We're simply not that generous. If you have made one of those purchases that grants you a free upgrade, you will receive this on the day of the general release. It will be sent out automatically by our sales system um, as long as everything goes well, which it did last year at least. 
uh, and you should probably have it in the morning the day of the 14th. Now if for some reason um, you choose to wait with purchasing your upgrade then you'll be happy to know that we're making no changes to the upgrade prices which means that after the release of 2023 you will be able to purchase an upgrade for well ranging from 99 euros to 149 euros depending on which edition you have so this is taken from the current price table and this will stay the same after the release of 2023 so it'll be the same prices moving on um, with the release of 2023 we are also discontinuing capture nexum uh, this goes hand in hand with the fact that we offer a five-year support plan which means that anytime during these five years you can basically postpone upgrading to the latest version of capture but once these five years have passed if you haven't purchased an upgrade by then then you are effectively falling out of the support plan so if you are one of those who are still working on a capture nexum then the next five weeks are your last chance to purchase an upgrade at a low price after that you will have to buy a new license from scratch Moving on to some more technical details, the minimum requirements of Capture 2023 remain unchanged from 2022. This means that you need Windows 10 or better, or Mac OS 10.15 Catalina or better. Worth mentioning is that when we released Capture 2022, there were parts of it that were not yet fully Apple Silicon compatible. This was because inside Capture are a number of software components delivered to us by other companies like SketchUp, NDI, Cinema 4D and so on. So when we released Capture 2022, in order to use some of these features you had to run Capture in Rosetta. Now this has been addressed since then and in the latest version of Capture 22 this isn't the case anymore. But I just want to reiterate that of course with Capture 2023 there is full Apple Silicon support and no need to use Rosetta. And this means that it's both M1 and M2 compatible and runs natively on those processors. Now, as I'm sure you will be curious which features there are going to be in Capture 2023, we are going to do four teaser Fridays up until the release. So make sure that you follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Actually, we might even post on LinkedIn. We are trying to build some presence on LinkedIn as well. Uh, it seems to be more popular for professional networking and even some professional socializing as some people have been moving away from other platforms as well these things tend to happen over time so having said that i'm going to see if we have any questions regarding um, capture 2023 uh, i have one here so if you have more questions on that topic then please post away I'm soon going to move on to more general questions, so if you have more general questions then feel free to post them as well. Now, Olivier Legrand asked or writes, I have upgraded my Duet from 2021 to 2022 last week. I hope I will be part of the grace period. Unfortunately, I will have to disappoint you there. Uh, the grace period starts today and we are annoyingly strict about that because once you start making exceptions uh, you're basically just moving the date to another date and then you could go on forever so unless you have purchased today 
or later, then you are not entitled to the free upgrade. I'm sorry. Apparently, a lot of you are asking questions along the line. Will you be doing this and that in Capture 2023? But I have no intention of asking that kind of question. You will have to tune in to the release webcast the 13th of March in order to learn which features we put in 2023. So I'm going to move on to the, the recap segment with some general useful information that I think is, is worth mentioning, um, starting with some support channels. There are two official support channels uh, that we maintain. These are email and the forums on our website. And then there are some user groups out there as well, which could be considered support channels that we monitor, although we don't participate that actively. So when it comes to email, we have three email addresses that are important. It's the support at, library at, and sales at email addresses. If you mail us at these, this is your, that is your fastest response channel, which means it's the, the method you are most likely to get a quick answer from us regarding anything really. We monitor the support mail throughout the day and there are numerous people that can step in and assist with different questions. So whenever you are in need of a fast answer, mail us, that is the best method for that. <coughs> Excuse me. Next, we have our forums that are hosted on our website. These are divided into two categories. We have the official forums and we have the community forums. The idea with the community forums is to give you a chance to help each other out because often questions aren't strictly technical and there's some element of, let's say, not artistry necessarily, but uh, it's maybe about best practices on how to make a plot look good under certain circumstances. And, and our users will often have better ideas than us who make the software sometimes uh, on what a good answer to the question is. So in the three community support forums, we tend not to step in and answer anything unless it's obvious that there will be no fast or direct answer among users. And then, in addition to this, we have the two official forums where one is a pure broadcast channel. This is the announcements forum, where we can post important technical information that we wouldn't necessarily blog about or write anywhere else. And of course, the feature request forum. The feature request forum is where you can post your feature requests. You can read other people's feature requests. You can upvote feature requests. And perhaps most importantly for me at least, we can have discussions sometimes about particular feature requests so that we can understand your needs better. In general, you users, you guys tend to ask for a solution to a problem or rather a specific solution. Sometimes it turns out that another solution um, solves more problems at the same time. So it's important for us to have a discussion about why you ask about a particular solution in case we can build on that and create something better. So those were the official support channels that we uh, work very actively with. On top of this, there are also a number of user groups out there on social media of different types. There is the Capture Design and Visualization group on Facebook, which is probably the largest user group out there, or definitely is. I know there are also user groups in um, or different languages, let's say. So there's also a, like a Capture France group, for instance, on Facebook. And I also know that in other countries like Germany, there's, I believe it's a WeChat group uh, of capture users. Now we try to monitor these and be present, 
more in order to, to learn and understand how you use Capture and what kind of challenges you run into. We will answer some things there occasionally, um, but in, in general, don't rely on these as a place to go to for help from us. Um, and the, the main reason for that is that it's very hard to work in a structured way uh, with these kind of groups because Facebook notifications are flimsy, they get lost and, well, and more important than anything is you can't pass a discussion among several people. So if you mail us, we can pass that support ticket between the library guys or the software department or the support guys, which is really important for, for the communication. So that's that about support channels. I also want to say something briefly about software quality. Um, we take the stability of capture quite seriously and we track statistics of this. Whenever you start capture, capture communicates with our web server to check what is the latest version of capture which is when you might get this pop-up telling you there's an update. At the same time as that happens, we also transfer a little bit of information about if there have been any recent crashes. And this is how we can gather some statistics about each individual release to track the stability over time. Now, that is all good, but unless you send us some crash reports, then we can't actually fix any crashes. So the tracking lets us see what's going on, but in order to improve things, it's very important that you help us out by sending us a crash report whenever Capture crashes. Now, unfortunately, in maybe 50% of, of the cases, we aren't actually able to do anything with the crash report because sometimes it doesn't contain all the information we need. But sometimes that's, the same crash, um, if you run into it many times, maybe the third or the second or the fourth crash report actually contains what we need so that we can fix something and make capture better. And this goes not only for crash reports, but bugs in general. Um, so here's a screenshot that's been lightly modified to prevent identification. This is from our uh, issue or support ticketing system, OS Tickets, where, and this is our backend to your emails when you mail us for support, where we can pass the issues among each other, as I mentioned before. So whenever you run into a crash or any issue really, please make sure to reach out to us so that we can fix that. It's very hard for us to come across all the bugs on our own because often they are a result of a complex chain of events or using particular softwares that we simply wouldn't even think of sometimes. So we really want to make capture as bug free and stable as possible, but we do need your help for that. So that is really important. Circling back to a few questions. Um, we have one from screenshot 001 secret agent of screenshots um, asking am i correct assuming that with capture 2018 i have one more year before needing to obtain a new full license yes this is correct so the coming year is your last chance to purchase an upgrade or you would have to start from scratch and buy a new full license again thanks for asking Svan is asking, how do we send the reports? You mail them to support at capture.se. I believe on Windows, if you get a crash, uh, it generates a crash report, uh, a file that is saved where you choose to save it. And then we would ask that you attach that in an email to us. On Mac OS, there is a dialogue that pops up that says something about an unexpected error. And there's a button that says report dot dot. And if you press that button, the window expands and there's a long detailed text 
very long. And if you could please then copy that text and send that in an email to us, that is how we could tackle the crash. Um, I wish there was a more compact way on Mac, but unfortunately that's just the way it is on the Mac with crash reports. All right, so I have a few questions here that are not licensing or product related. I also have a few questions prepared from social media that I felt I should comment on. <coughs> Omar is asking, Hi all, uh, I can't be present tonight, but I want to ask if it's possible to have a more present forum. Uh, a lot of times problems are resolved in private mail, but this prevents people from learning. Um, so yes, we're not that present on the community support forums. It's not so easy for us to follow up on that. Um, so we'll take your feedback into consideration for any future changes. Um, but still, we're thankful for the feedback uh, so that we can improve. Uh, then Omar is asking about simple geometric plan forms with images, um, which is something we are aware of, would be quite useful. Uh, Roy Arnevold is uh, saying, hello, I'm having trouble connecting Capture to the MA3 desk. Is there a link to this setup? Um, I th we, have, we have as a plan to make a tutorial on the connecting capture with the MA3 system. It is a little bit complicated because an MA3 system could look in many different ways and you could be both on Mac or Windows. So um, next webcast is going to be the release webcast. So it's probably a few months away, but we're going to have a look at the connectivity page on our website uh, and see what needs updating there. So if you haven't found the connectivity page on our website, that's a good place to start whenever you're trying to connect the console with Capture. We do have some useful um, information there. And I believe we have the links to the, um, uh, we have these packages with Capture files matching console files, demo packs, we call them, I believe. Uh, they are also under the support menu on the website. So now I'm going to move on to a few things that I picked up on, on social media that I wanted to comment on. Um, the first one being dark mode on Windows, which is something that we get um, asked about quite frequently. Technically speaking, there are a few different fundamental types of applications on Windows. Um, they might look the same to you, but under the hood, there are some very different architectures. And we're using the one called desktop app, which is the one that's been around since Windows 95. And unfortunately, dark mode doesn't really work for that type of app. Uh, Microsoft haven't gotten around to do that. So what we would then basically have to do is more or less rewrite the entire user interface to support dark mode on Windows. So that's not very likely going to happen. But if you are asking this in order to get rid of the very bright title bar when you're running full screen visualizing, then keep in mind that you can go full screen on a view. And when you do that, you lose the title bar. So if it's the title bar that's annoying you, it's a very good workaround to simply go full screen in that view because that solves the problem then. Another uh, solution is, uh, putting some black gaffer tape on top of the screen, but I do not recommend that. Unless you want it there in a very permanent fashion. Uh, next, there was an interesting question only a few days ago about uh, images and renders on Mac and the live visualization looking quite different from the renders that come out of Capture. Um, one reason for that will be that the live visualization is actually in HDR, which is um, the ability to use more intensity in the computer display than on an old school display. And when you render, you don't get HDR renders, you get SDR renders, which are the old traditional 
sort of screen brightness type of images and they will look dull in comparison to the live visualization. <coughs> now we are hoping to make some improvements in this area but the truth is this, this is a technology that is still evolving uh, and there are images that support HDR but they might not work in some viewers and so on so there is some progress in this field, but it's, I think it will take another year or two until it's really is working well. Uh, next, there was uh, Benjamin Small put up a survey on Facebook uh, asking some interesting questions about visualization. And one of the questions asked in the survey, which I think you should help him out with, is would you be comfortable to completely replace in-person pre-production in a venue and solely rely on using a visualizer to plan and design a show with no in-person venue time? And this sets off a number of alarm bells for me where I feel it's important to point out that even though we try very hard to make the visualization as realistic as possible, there are plenty of quirks in moving lights, physical limitations um, like noise or heat, uh, temperature and so on that mean that sometimes they do things that we just could never simulate. So <laughs> please never ever consider to completely replace any in-person pre-production in the venue and completely rely on a visualizer you would have to have worked with that specific equipment probably numerous times in order to be able to pull off anything like that. In general, you do need to have access to the real hardware if you want to take it to this, to this level of um, pre-production. Yeah, I'm not really selling our product here, but you have to be honest sometimes and not forget that there are limitations in visualization. Um, this is simply the way it is. Now I'm going to pick a couple of questions before I move on to the geolocations. Um, Ilario Pizzocero is asking, what kind of requirements will you suggest in order to manage the pre-programming? And here I'm assuming the question is about the horsepower of the computer that's going to run capture. Um, Every now and then we, we bring up this topic and I make some kind of guide in a, in a webcast and I mention some performance numbers. Um, unfortunately, these videos tend to hang around for a while and people get back to them maybe two, three years later. And unfortunately by then they are no longer relevant. Um, I think that the general recommendation here is don't cheap out on the graphics card, um, but also try to get your hands on a computer and actually test it. Because by the end of the day, you are the judge of whether the quality on screen is good enough for you or not. And people have very different um, bars or standards. So if you're looking at buying a ready-made computer, maybe there is a store you can go to where the computer is on display. And you can bring with you like a presentation file from Capture or even download the demo on location and try it out on the computer. That would be my top recommendation to try and get your hands on the computer and see if it's good enough. Uh, next question. I'm going to skip a few. Um, Ryan Richards asks, how is the performance with capture on a Mac Studio graphics compared to an NVIDIA graphics card? Also pretty hard to, to compare, but the top of the line uh, M1 seemed to match roughly a top of the line 3070 card. Uh, now I'm getting pretty specific here, <coughs> but I would say that the, the most expensive Mac doesn't beat the most expensive NVIDIA card, but it, it's not that far away from it. And th 
one thing you have to keep in mind that on the Mac in general, you are running much more higher resolution screens than on Windows. Even if you're buying the most expensive Windows laptop, chances are it's not even 4K. Whereas your Mac laptop is definitely 4K, if not 5 or 6K. So uh, there are more differences between the computers than just the graphics card. So it's hard to make a comparison like that. Um, now, before I run out of time, I'm going to move on to the last thing I had prepared, which was related to geolocation. Arthur asked on Facebook whether it's possible <clears throat> to add a plane from Google Maps or so um, in order to form a festival ground uh, using some kind of geolocation. Uh, to which we suggested doing it with SketchUp and someone said we should show you how to do that. So I'm going to try and show you how to use SketchUp to bring in imagery from Google Maps for a geolocation and then bring that into Capture. So like a TV chef I have prepared, I have SketchUp running here. So I'm going to start a new SketchUp drawing. And you do need SketchUp Pro, the paid version for this, otherwise I don't believe you can pull it off. I'm going to go to the File menu under Geolocation and select Add Location. Next, uh, you get a map view where you can search for locations. Now, <laughs> this has already found what I was going to search for. But if I type Liberty Island, New York and hit search, this is what I'm presented with. And you can zoom in and out, you can move the map. <clears throat> and the idea is to place the needle at the center of your geolocation and then hit the select region button. Now, if you zoom out, you're going to grab a larger region, which is going to take more time. So I would advise you against zooming too far out. So try and select the area that is really relevant. And then you hit import. It does some internet thinking or whatever it does. And voila, here are some images from Google Maps applied to a surface. Now, you can go into that geolocation menu and click show terrain. In this case, it doesn't make that much of a difference, but you can see that Liberty Island is in fact sticking out of the water a little bit. So what I can do now is I can save this. Let's put it on the desktop. Let's call it statue because this is where the Statue of Liberty lives which perhaps everyone knew except me, but anyway. So now I can move back into Capture. I can use Import Model from the File menu. Select my Statue SketchUp file. And voila! Here we now have... Now it's pretty dark in my live view here. But once you bring this in and add some lighting, then of course this makes more sense. So this is how you can bring in Google map imagery uh, onto a surface flat or with terrain. Um, it's also oriented in a north-south um, correct fashion. So if you're drawing a house, for instance, and you want to do some, let's say, sunlight studies using capture, which I think is not very usual, but anyway, then it's good to have the orientation of the, uh, the location as well. Um, yeah, and once I'm here, of course, select the entire thing and drag that into your design. And there you go. So now I've shown you how to do that as you asked, and I will jump back in here and answer, I think, one last question from D. Hanut, who says, Hi Lars, graphics cards, is an RTX 4090 way too much for capture or worth buying? 
Does NVIDIA's new technology play a role in capture? Question mark. And is capture still running single core on the CPU? So capture has actually never ever run single core on the CPU as far as I can ever remember, to be honest. Capture has always run on multiple cores or even multiple CPUs. The question though, of course, is how well has it done that? But Capture has been using multiple cores in a good way for visualization for a few years actually. So it's definitely not true that Capture would run on a single core. Uh, I think the more cores you have, the better. It depends a little bit on what you are visualizing. Um, a good example is video playback. So if you're using a video player in Capture to play back local video files, then Capture can process files concurrently. So the more cores you have, the more video files you could process concurrently. But Capture also simulates particle systems for special effects, which also benefit from concurrent processing. And in a release coming to you soon, I think I can I can throw in a semi-teaser here. We are, have also pulled concurrency to a max when it comes to things like opening a project file, which will be much faster in Capture 2023, thanks to using all the cores in a much more efficient manner. So I definitely think you should choose a computer with many cores. Now you don't have to go for a Threadripper. I don't think that is worth it. Um, that will be overkill. In terms of NVIDIA's new technology, I guess you are referring to RTX, which we are not making use of. Um, and I don't think we have, it's not that imminent that we will be doing that either. Um, so from that point of view, you could go for the regular GTX cards from NVIDIA. I don't know if there's a GTX 1490, I doubt that. Um, now, whether the 1490 is too much or not depends completely on what you're visualizing. Um, the faster your card is, the higher quality the visualization in Capture is. So the resolution basically adjusts itself to the frame rate you're getting. So the faster card, the crisper the visualization is going to be. So it's completely up to you how much money you are willing to spend on getting a very good looking visualization. And with that, I'm going to thank you so much for watching tonight. I will see you again in five weeks for the release webcast, which I'm already quite excited about. Thank you for watching and see you again in five weeks. Good evening.